Hello and welcome to week three of our journey through science and scripture and faith. And uh, this week we're going to look at um, quantum physics. Um, and in particular, we wanna look at the question of determinism and free will. This is a, a long standing topic in uh, Christianity about whether we, we have freedom uh, of our will in any way, or whether we're determined, does, does God decide who's going to be saved? Does, does God decide who's going to be damned? Um, you know, is, is it a heresy? To believe that we would make that decision, even if if we would just be cooperating uh, with the, the possibility, does God provide the possibility, and then we uh, God empowers us to make the, what what actually happens? Um, does God uh, plan every last detail of our life? You know, if I if I'm in a car accident, is God trying to teach me something? Does God allow some things to happen just by chance? Does God let me decide what kind of Jello I want for lunch? Um, this is kind of uh, a long, 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 long standing uh, topic that uh, people have, Christians have, and uh, non-Christians have talked about for a very long time. So um, let's, let's dig right in. So the rise of science, we talked about this in our first week, the rise of science uh, in the 1600s um, led a lot of people to believe in a very a mechanistic universe, a universe that was something like a machine. God, it follows certain rules. God, you know, creates the machine. He puts gas in the machine. He winds it up. And now it's just running on its own. That's the deistic uh, universe that we talked about um, some time ago. And we also talked about miracles. What is a miracle within that framework? And I gave you my sense that a miracle is when God interrupts the flow of cause and effect uh, in, in the world he created and does something that doesn't fit within the law of cause and effect. And so that's, that's kind of the world that um, uh, arose in understanding in the 1600s. But uh, there was a real strong sense in that time of, well, it's, it's therefore a mathematical equation. It's like, it's like when you hit a pool ball and if you knew all the math, this is the theory, that if you knew all the math, you knew all the angles, um, you, you could predict exactly where all the balls were going to end up. And you can largely predict where all the balls are going to, go, going to end up if the balls are perfectly smooth, if, if the, the felt of the pool table is perfectly level and perfectly smooth, um, if you know exactly where the focus of your hit with the cube, uh, you know, the cue was, um, the problem is, is that there are uh, micro dimensions to the cue balls. There are micro dimensions to the felt. Um, and, and so it's unlikely that we would be able to account for all the little bits. But still, um, we might believe that if we knew all of the positions and all of the momentum and all of the, um, the, the velocity and so forth, that we would be able to predict exactly where all the, the balls would end up. And this is the kind of universe uh, that was more or less assumed uh, in the, the late 1600s and, and early 1700s. And I've already mentioned in that first video how uh, this framework created a kind of distinction between the natural world and the book of nature, as Galileo put it, and the supernatural world, which is the world of, the, of angels and God, if, you, if they believed in it, um, and so forth. Now, I've also mentioned that in that context, what was theism easily became deism. Theism is the belief not only that God exists, but that God is involved in the world. Deism is the idea that God exists, God created the world, but God is no longer involved in the world. And so in a deistic universe, um, there are no miracles. Um, Thomas Jefferson, for example, would have been a deist. The world in this in this period, the world became um, what Charles Taylor calls a disenchanted world. Um, so whereas before the scientific revolution, uh, so for example, take Martin Luther, uh, the, the starter uh, kind of the Lutheran church, church comes from Martin Luther, Protestantism um, comes from Martin Luther. If you're not a Catholic, it's because of Martin Luther, probably uh, because uh, everybody was pretty much Catholic in the Western world, at least if they were a Christian until the 1500s. And then Luther kind of created a critical mass of exodus, 
uh, exit from uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And then we got all these other groups. We got the Reformed, we got uh, Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and oh my. And so, um, uh, but Luther, Luther's call to ministry was in a thunderstorm. And, you know, when I, when there's a thunderstorm, I don't think the devil's out to get me, or I don't think a demon's trying to get me, you know, if it's lightning and thundering. I think, well, I should probably um, get in a place to where I'm not struck by electrons, you know. Um, and so I think of a, a thunderstorm as a physical, scientific kind of phenomenon. Now, I can still die, but, but I don't think of it as God trying to teach me a lesson. But for Martin Luther in the year 15-something, early 1500s, um, before 1517, um, he has this thunderstorm experiment, experiment, uh, experience in which he says, Lord, you know, if I survive this, I'll become a, a monk. I'll become a, a priest. Uh, and he does survive it, and he does become a priest. But um, what I'm getting at is Luther saw that as a spiritual experience. Um, you know, that there were, there were spirits and, and demons, you know, that were uh, part of natural phenomena. Now, um, I think you all and I believe in, in, I don't know, I don't know exactly what you believe, but that there's a good chance that, that if you're watching this video, you believe in angels and you believe in demons and you believe in, in Satan and, and so forth. But um, uh, we don't necessarily associate it with rocks and trees and things like, like that. Uh, usually, not in the Western world. And so uh, now there may be some Christians in the world that, that do, but, but for, for those of us who've come under the European influence, um, we no longer associate uh, natural, well, I mean, I mean, I can't speak for you, but the world became somewhat disenchanted after the scientific revolution. We have the natural world, we have natural laws, and then we have supernatural things. Uh, that happen. Um, you may have heard of the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, it's, you know, it's a tiger and a young boy. Uh, the tiger's imaginary. Well, the thing is, did you know that John Calvin and Thomas Hobbes uh, lived in the 1600s? And this, the, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes is about this, this period of time. We have a theologian and we have a philosopher. Um, both of them believed in a very deterministic universe. Um, so it's, it's not just you know, science where this is going on, but, but it's, no, it's no coincidence, I would say, that John Calvin, who taught predestination, the idea that God chooses who will be saved, you know, that our, our salvation is determined by God before we're ever born, before the creation of the world, God has decided who's going to be saved. You know, I can't be, I have, for Calvin uh, and for Reformed, the Reformed and Presbyterian churches today, I have no real say in whether I um, come to Christ or not, whether I believe or not. It's all been determined uh, by the grace of God, and God's grace is irresistible. More on that in a second. Hobbes also, as a philosopher, not particularly Christian in my mind, but, but Hobbes um, also believed in a, in a deterministic universe where everything happens. This is part of the what we call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age um, in, in the 1600s. And so what we have is this sense that whatever happens, happens of necessity. Uh, so the idea that the ordinary definition of a free agent is incoherent. They, they would say in this time period that the idea of us having any freedom at all doesn't make any sense. That's a quote from Thomas Hobbes himself. And so you, you're getting a sense of um, the, the kind of zeitgeist, the, the, the worldview, as it were, of the 1600s. And, and, you, and this, of course, our worldview, this is the thing we don't always realize that we're wearing glasses. Our worldview affects the way we read the Bible. We may think that we're getting our ideas from the Bible alone, but we're always bringing our glasses, our cultural glasses. And I don't just mean the broader culture. I mean, even our Christian cultural glasses, because there is a Wesleyan culture or a Baptist culture, those things. Um, and there's a, a kind of um, conservative Christian culture and liberal Christian culture, uh, although I don't really like those terms. They're far too imprecise to me. But, but we bring our assumptions to the biblical text. We can't help it. We try to fight it. I try to fight it. You try to fight it. But we, we bring our assumptions to the text and lo and behold, 
the Bible teaches Baptist things, or the Bible teaches Wesleyan things, or the Bible teaches Lutheran things. And we think that we're getting it from the biblical text. And hopefully to some degree we are, but there's always this tension between our, our paradigms and our perspectives and our worldviews and the text itself. So we have to enter this kind of dialogue between us and the biblical text to, to constantly recycle back, to correct our understanding and go back, and then to correct our understanding and to go back. And so John Calvin, who is a good, uh, I, I trust he's in heaven, um, gave rise to a lot of uh, probably the dominant theological force in America, uh, at least in, in Christian colleges, not, not necessarily at Houghton, but um, uh, the Reformed tradition comes from John Calvin. And Calvin read the Bible in a very deterministic way um, as he brought his cultural glasses with him uh, to the text. And we can see the forces that led to this or that were part of the mix of this, a world in which we thought of nature as being run by natural laws like a machine uh, in which if we knew in which people thought that if they knew all of the all of the variables they could predict everything for the rest of the universe that's the way they thought um, here's laplace if this is a famous quote by pierre simone laplace in 1814 if the demon and he's talking about any kind of spiritual being here uh, that's smarter than we are that his point by the demon is this I don't think he means necessarily evil demon. Uh, maybe he did, maybe he did. But, um, but if the demon knows the precise location and momentum of every atom in the universe, the past and the future values for any given time are entailed. They can be calculated from the laws of classical mechanics. So Laplace completely believed that everything that ever happened in the entire universe for all time was completely determined. That if we knew all the variables, we would be able to predict everything that would happen for the rest of the universe. That is the worldview uh, that was dominant in the 1600s, 1700s, and even here in the early uh, 1800s. Okay, so deterministic universe. Um, and that's the way a lot of Christians viewed it. Now, uh, by the way, I'm Wesleyan. John Wesley was not um, uh, a Calvinist of this sort. I think I have the tulip. Uh, somewhere in this. Let me let me see if I have the tulip later on. Okay, I'm going to talk about the tulip when we're live. Uh, but the tulip is is basically a encapsulation of John Calvin's uh, theology. It's the idea that humanity can't doesn't have any power to do anything freely. Uh, and therefore, if we're going to be saved, it has to be entirely uh, God's doing is unconditional choosing, and that we can't resist it. If he's chosen us, we're going to be saved. Um, and that um, it's irresistible and, and we're gonna make it if we're chosen. Now, that's, that's Calvinism. Um, that's a, a very deterministic um, view of the world, as I said, with its roots, um, at least its most recent roots in the 1600s. Now, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a Wesleyan. Wesleyans come from the Methodist tradition and from J John Wesley in the 1700s in England. And Wesley was influenced by a guy named Jacob, Jacob uh, Arminius. Uh, uh, who lived in the, the 1600s. And basically, if I would summarize Wesley's understanding, it was that God powers us up just a little, every, everybody, that God powers up humanity just a little for us to be able to say more. And then the more that we, the more that we accept God's grace, the more he turns the dimmer switch up until we can, by God's grace, uh, make a choice um, to be uh, to be uh, a choice for God. And so um, Wesleyans believed in a God empowered free will, not a total free will, not a blank slate free will, uh, but a by the grace of God empowered uh, participation and cooperation um, with God's grace. More on that when we're uh, together in, in person. Well, let's talk about quantum physics, shall we? This is the science part of uh, this week. So quantum physics arose in the um, early 1900s. In fact, in the year 1900 itself, there was a scientist by the name of Max Planck. Uh, he was German, um, who was having trouble with a particular uh, problem in physics. The problem is, is that if he assumed that um, energy was you could, that energy was completely uh, continuous, going going up or down, you know that basically 
to get from one to two, you go through 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you know, that, that to get from one to two, you go through all the, all the fractions in between one and two. And the math that he was doing, um, if, he, uh, if he made that assumption, then uh, energy would, would um, fry us all, basically. He came to the conclusion that, um, that if, well, he didn't come to a conclusion. He, he, he considered this kind of a, uh, a tactic that he had to do to make the thing work. He didn't like it, uh, but he said, well, okay, my equations work if I assume that energy exists in little packets rather than a continuous wave. So basically on the very, 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 very fundamental level of reality, Planck said, you can't go from, you can't go from zero to 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 and so forth, or from zero to 0 0.001, 0 0.002, or 0 0.000001, 0 0.000002, that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't happen like that that on the most fundamental le level of reality, energy goes from zero to one to two, um, and there's no in between. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Zeno's paradox. Uh, Zeno, uh, Zeno's paradox is the idea that, that if I shoot an arrow from here to there, it first has to go halfway, but before it can go halfway, it has to go halfway to halfway. And before it goes halfway to halfway, it has to go halfway to halfway to halfway, and so on. And basically uh, the paradox is how can the arrow ever reach its target because it has to go through all these halfways and these halfways go to infinity and so forth. Of course, Zeno was thinking of space um, and there is some, um, there is quantum space. I'm reading a book actually, I have it somewhere on my desk, quantum space, um, but that's not important right now. But the idea is what if reality actually is not smooth on the most fundamental level, but it, it is um, quantized um, like that the energy of uh, an electron doesn't go from through the halfway points, but that the that on the on the um, atomic level, energy goes from zero to one to two, and there's no in between. It just jumps, it, it skips, um, and it's not a continuous wave. Well, this is what uh, Max uh, Planck suggested um, in 1900. He didn't suggest it because he liked it, he suggested because it made his equations work. And you know, what we're going to find um, when we look at quantum physics is uh, there's a famous, um, there was a famous um, scientist in the 19, late 1900s named Richard Feynman. Um, he was, by the way, one of the ones that helped uh, solve the space shuttle, the Challenger disaster. Um, he, was, he was one of the ones who, who explained why that happened. Um, but anyway, Feynman, he's passed now. Um, but, but Feynman um, uh, once said that nobody understands quantum physics. We know how to use the equations. You know, we can do for quantum physics, but he said nobody, nobody understands um, quantum physics. Anyway, so uh, Planck didn't necessarily like this idea that energy came in little packets, little, little to ketchup pa packets. Can't buy continuous ketchup. You have to buy it in packets. Um, and so... Uh, Planck basically said that energy seems to exist. Now, the, the next 30 years from 1900 to 1930 were the most generative years in physics in all of history. More, more revolution was done in physics in those 30 years um, than, in any other, than any other period of history in terms of scientific understanding. In 1925, a lot of this quantum physics the early classical quantum physics was coming together. So Louis de Broglie uh, suggested that light sometimes uh, behave, behaves like a wave and sometimes it behaves like a particle. You know, and we're like, what? A wave's a wave, a particle's a particle. Uh, but, um, and, and this had been a long-standing debate. Uh, Isaac Newton in the 1600s said waves like a particle. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell in the 1800s says lights like a wave. And then you have uh, de Broglie basically saying uh, it's both particle and wave. And um, then in 1926, you had a guy named Werner Heisenberg who said that you can't know the position and momentum of a particle with any cer certainty. Um, if, you know the if you know the position, you can't know the momentum. If you know the momentum, you can't know the position. This was a wild and wacky, wacky time. I wish I could have been smart enough and located enough to be part of 
of some of these discussions. I'd have loved to sit in the corner drinking a cup of coffee, coffee listening to them argue with, with each other. But um, quantum physics emerges uh, out of the 1920s uh, as a wild and wacky theory. Um, that has helped us. Um, a lot of the things that we do now uh, in science uh, from our cell phones again and our electronic equipment, the, our electronic equipment would, wouldn't work. We would not have laptops if this understanding of quantum physics had not have arisen. And every time these things are tested, it, it's verified. Um, and so it's not like uh, these are just crazy people, although some of them may be crazy. Um, and some of them, some of their theories aren't proven like string theory is not proven. Um, I'm not sure it can be proven um, uh, because it, it happens on such a, such a minute level that there's no way for us to test it, it seems, at least not yet. But where I'm going with this is uh, building off of Heisenberg is that the quantum world is a fundamentally uncertain world. So if the 1600s um, left us with uh, a sense of determinism, the early 20th century left us with a sense of relativism and of uncertainty. Um, it seems to me that the, the phrase relativism uh, probably does go back in some way uh, to the feel that was created by Einstein's relativity. It's not the same thing. You know, don't, don't throw Einstein's relativity away because it has the same word as rel relativism. But I'm sure that, that the feel of relativity in some way um, uh, I'm not sure, but I have a hypothesis. I could test it by doing some research, but I have a hypothesis that some of the negativity toward relativism in the 20th century Christianity, you know, that that whole feel probably had something to do with, with Einstein. But, but this uncertainty uh, of, of the quantum world has also uh, been a part of uh, late 20th century culture, perhaps postmodernism in some way uh, is, is, uh, comes from the fruitful fruitful soil, as it were, of an uncertain uh, fundamental uh, world. But, um, you know, coming out of the 1920s, there was this sense that um, there is a fundamental uncertainty about uh, the most basic level of life. Uh, Einstein didn't like this. Einstein said, no, no, we'll figure it out. There are, there's some, something we haven't found yet. There's some hidden variables here. Einstein wanted the world to be deterministic. Um, he wanted the world to be predictable. Um, uh, he has a famous saying that God doesn't play dice. Now, Einstein didn't believe it in a personal God, but this quote, God doesn't play dice, that you may have heard, was his idea that, nope, nope, this can't be as uncertain as it's seeming to be. There must be hidden variables, but of course, no one has ever found them. And, and um, some Bell's theorem uh, suggests that it can't be found. Now, I, I'm not sure that Bell's right on that, uh, don't take my word for it. There are scientists who aren't sure that Bell's right on that. But as far as we can tell, no one has ever found these extra variables uh, that would explain uh, certainty on the atomic level. Einstein sp spent the last part of his life trying to figure out how it wouldn't be like this. Um, it's, it's Sometimes it's considered a shame uh, that Einstein, uh, again, not everybody views it this way, but some would say that Einstein wasted the last decades of his life trying to find something that was wrong, um, trying to create certainty on the quantum level, which is an uncertain kind of place. Again, these are things that we can't say uh, with certainty uh, because um, they're, still, they're still being processed out in science and they may never be figured out. Again, I don't think that there is a specific Christian perspective on quantum uncertainty. Um, it's, it's, it's not become a polarizing issue, um, which I'm glad because we can maybe have an open mind. The problem with when, when, when people have discussed these things uh, in, in, a, in a religious context, uh, sides are drawn and then no, no, you, and so I hope that you're, and I, I hope I've not presented this in a way that's caused you already to take a side here because we just don't know. There are Christian perspectives that could fit with quantum uncertainty and there are Christian perspectives that would reject quantum uncertainty probably. And so we have, uh, we have two different, uh, we have Christians on both sides of this one. And thankfully we haven't, uh, we haven't um, uh, this hasn't become an, a, an issue of Christian polarization, which means that we're, we, have, we can have an open mind about 
what, what it seems to me. Now, of course, I, I doubt that there's anybody, and I don't mean any offense uh, to anybody, but, but there aren't a lot of people that understand this on a level to where they really can make any kind of a, an educated guess. And in fact, um, those who know the most about it can agree on it. Uh, so, so I don't think that we're going to be deciding this um, in this video or in this, this, if you're doing this for the class. Um, this is something that we, is, is above our, our mental pay grade, I would say, above anybody's mental pay grade. Some have suggested that God is the one that takes care of the quantum uncertainty, that, that basically when you have uncertainty on the quantum level, God tips his finger on the scale. This would be a much more involved God than the God of miracles being God interrupting the cause effect. The idea that God makes, nope, that electron's gonna be there, that electron's gonna be there, that photon's gonna be there. That would be a God who is much more involved uh, in determining the events of the universe um, uh, than, for example, um, my, my Wesleyan sensibilities are that God doesn't feel the need to determine everything, that God doesn't micromanage the universe, that God doesn't necessarily determine, um, that God doesn't have just one person for you to marry necessarily. That God doesn't care whether you get the green jello or the red jello most times. There may be some times where God wants you to get the green jello, uh, but most of the time God will let you uh, and the quantum fluctuations on the micro level of your brain decide whether you're gonna have pudding or not. Um, so I don't think there's a singular Christian perspective on this. I think that we are free to, uh, to think about it. To me, um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you my cards, uh, because I believe that God uh, lets us, uh, empowers us to decide our eternal fate. He, he, he gives us the power to either choose him or, or he allows us to, by default, reject him um, because of our sinful, the power of sin. Um, I like the idea that God has created a, a free will in the creation, as it were, that the, even, the, even the creation has a kind of freedom on the quantum level to, deci to decide on its own, independent of God's determinism, uh, how things will, uh, will play out. I, I like that. It fits with my theology. Does that make it right? I don't know if it's right or not. We'll ask God when we get, uh, but, but what I'm suggesting is, I hope you won't say, I'm waiting to find out what the Christian view is on quantum uncertainty, because I don't think there is a singular Christian view. I think there can be uh, different Christians with different perspectives on uh, quantum uncertainty. Well, Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg, um, he said basically, uh, remember, he's the one with the uncertainty principle. He's the one that said we cannot know the position and momentum of, of a particle with equal um, uh, precision. Uh, be, now, for Heisenberg, initially, this was a problem of measurement, uh, that if you, if you measure the momentum, you mess up the position, and if you measure the position, you mess up the momentum. And so initially, for Heisenberg, um, his uncertainty principle was a problem that we'll just never be able to measure this. Um, but uh, Niels Bohr, um, who was um, one of the, he was probably the, the most influential figure in, the, in this period of, of physics, quantum physics, he said, nope. There is no position or momentum until you measure it. And this is, I think, probably the dominant position now. By the way, phys physicists don't spend a lot, quantum physicists don't spend a lot of time debating this stuff anymore. In fact, a lot of physicists consider this philosophical debate to be a waste of time. Uh, they just follow the equations. Uh, that's kind of the motto of a lot of uh, physics departments. Don't worry about what this means. Let the theology department talk about what this means. Let the philosophy department talk about what this means. We're physicists. We just, we just use the equations and predict you know, the probability that this is gonna happen. Um, but, but Niels Bohr in the 1920s, uh, he and Heisenberg, uh, Heisenberg you know, debated these things. For Bohr, and this is what I would, I would consider to be now the, probably the prevailing view, is that um, a particle like a photon which is a light particle, or an electron, which is an electricity particle, um, that they, it does not actually have a specific position or a specific momentum, that it, it exists as a kind of probability field. It's more likely to be here, less likely to be here, but in a sense, it's nowhere until you measure it or until something happens. And when something happens, then 
it decides where to be and it randomly decides where to be in but but if you if you like if you do one photon um if you send one photon and then another photon and then another photon we're going to talk about the double slit experiment in a second you know it's it the by the time all the photons are are there it's going to look a certain way but you can't you can't predict where a singular electron or photon you can't predict where a singular electron or photon is going to go um, it has a probability to go somewhere and by the time by the time you've shot 10,000 uh, electrons it's going to you're going to see a pattern that fits the probability but you cannot predict where a, a specific electron is going to go and Bohr would say because it isn't anywhere um, it's 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 a a possibility of being somewhere and until you measure it or until it gets to the screen it doesn't know where it's at um, now this is where Einstein said well we'll figure out what the variables are here that tell us where it's going to be uh, but but by the end of, of the, all of this craziness, Bohr will say, nope, it doesn't exist anywhere until something happens. And then we have what's called the collapse of the wave function. Um, that something, whether detecting where it is or whatever, changes um, the, the situation um, and makes it make up its mind. Um, by the way, there is a guy by the name of Hugh Everett, I'll just mention him here, who said that every time one of these uh, uh, quantum decisions is made, another universe is created. And so there are infinite number of universe, infinite number of possible worlds, um, a split every time a quantum uh, event happens, we have all of the possibilities represented in, yeah, anyway, I don't know how you would prove this. I don't know how you would disprove this, but since it seems to be completely crazy, um, I'm just gonna say, thank you, Hugh, please sit down. Okay, well, let's keep going. Um, now, if we had Laplace, if Laplace was a, uh, a quote for complete determinism, then Jacques Monod is going to give us a quote for complete chance. Um, here's, here's Jacques. Uh, Man knows that he's alone in the universe's immensity, out of which he emerged only by chance. So for Monod, I think it's Monod, um, for Monod, uh, this kind of a universe has no room for God. Well, why? Why is there no room for God? I think God is very creative. Uh, I, I think, to me, this is brilliant. That God has created a universe that can make decisions on its own on this level. Um, and um, uh, so there, there is, I mean, maybe, maybe the only Christians Jacques knew were, were Calvinists. Um, this doesn't fit very well with Calvinism at all. Fits perfectly fine with Wesleyan Arminian thought. Um, I don't have any problem with quantum physics at all theologically, doesn't hurt my faith in the slightest. Um, and of course, it may not be the last word. I mean, the people in the 1600s thought determinism was the last word. So uh, far be it from me to say that quantum indeterminism is the last word. We, we don't know uh, what the next century in physics will bring. Um, I, do not, I do not personally think that the Bible makes any, I mean, I don't know what the Greek word for quantum is. You know what I'm saying? I don't think the Bible directly addresses these questions. These are questions that are wholly beyond anything that the Bible addresses um, in, 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 on this level, in my opinion. Um, and so we are free to enjoy the ride, I think, as Christians on these sorts of things. Well, let me tell you about this double slit experiment again. So if you, have, if you send like a pulse of, of electrons through two slits, what's going to happen is uh, over time, on a screen behind the slits, you're going to get a, a wave distribution. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched two waves, like maybe you throw two rocks into a pond at the same time and you watch the, the ripples interact with each other. The ripples interacting with each other is called interference. Um, and there's a predictable wave interference that you get when you, when you do that kind of thing. Well, if you send a photon toward these slits, and they somewhat, they're allowed to do their own thing, what you'll find is behind on a screen, you're going to get a wave interference pattern. And so you say, aha, so um, electrons are waves. Well, if you do it, if you do it with just one slit, if I'm remembering correctly, you get a single um, distribution as if uh, the electron is a particle. Oh, so electrons particle. 
Um, but what's funny is, is if you detect, if you detect where the electron's going through the slit, you'll get two um, splotches. You don't get the wave. If you detect it, you, you, so what's, this is a very puzzling kind of thing. If you detect which slit a photon goes through, there will be no interference pattern, but two globs as if photons are particles. Um, and so um, what, in, in, in keeping with Bohr's understanding, what seems to be happening here, and far be it for me to think that I have this figured out. I've, I've read about the double slit experiment over and over and over again. I, I read about these things over and over again, and I'm like, I'm not sure I fully get this, but I, I, I try to console myself because nobody really gets this. I mean, certainly people get it better than me, but, but it, it seems to be that what's going on here is that when you, when you detect the uh, photon, that is, you force it to decide where it's at, it collapses and it becomes a particle and then you get globs. But if you don't detect it and you let it continue in its indeterminate form, then you get the wave pattern. And so this seems, this experiment seems to confirm that until an event happens or until you detect it, um, these sorts of things, they, they're not anywhere. The photon's not in any specific location. There is a probability of where you would find it if you tried to detect it. But it's the, the act of detection itself that makes it decide where it's going to be. So uh, here are some of the theories about this sort of thing. So classical realism is where Einstein was. Basically, it views these sorts of equations and things as, as actual descriptions of the world. Um, instrumentalism says, well, no, theories are just tools that we use that help us to talk about what happens. What happens doesn't, it's not real. You know, our equations are just kind of useful tools. Um, now, um, the author of this book, uh, Ian Barber, is a critical realist. Um, basically, that our theories are imperfect, uh, but there are models about a real world. The world is real, and our theories are not perfect, but our theories are attempts uh, to describe a wor world that actually does exist. Well, this, this is the end of this, um, our scientific part of our lecture today. We're going to talk a little bit more about scripture and about uh, theology, which is the study of God, and a little bit about um, what, how this might impact us as Christians. That's what we're going to talk about in our live section, session today. But I wanted to get on the table uh, in this preliminary video uh, a little sense of uh, quantum physics uh, and how it has, it has moved us away from a more deterministic um, sense of the world like they had in the 1600s to an indeterministic uh, sense of, of the world. The problem now is not, am I determined? The problem is now, raised by science, is there any purpose to anything at all? Um, and we'll talk about these things a little bit um, this week on science and faith, science and scripture.